All right. Hi. Uh, I'm Martijn. I'm uh, doing a PhD at OpenGeoHub, and I like big and useful maps. And that basically means having lots and lots of classes. Um, and I was inspired by this, actually not by my own free will, but um, <laughs> project restraints. Um, so yeah, we, we are seeing a global arms race in making global maps at high resolution. And uh, all the big players are you know, diving in. We have Esri with their uh, you know, land cover thing. We have Google with Dynamic World, which updates every month. And then we also have uh, the European Space Agency with their world cover product, which was lambasted at uh, LPS, the Living Plant Symposium, uh, last year for not sharing their training data, but being very accurate. But something that you know, these maps all have in common is that it's very impressive computationally wise because you know, it's a lot of data. And they have high accuracy, high resolution, but they, they have some limitations. Uh, for instance, they use different classification schemes. They have different legends. So it's really hard to compare them and actually assess how, or like which one is more accurate. Some people have already tried, but it's, it's really hard to do. And these papers are also not really well received. Um, besides having different legends, they also, they also have in common that these uh, legends have very little classes. And I mean, it's cool to see what kind of where deforestation happens in general, but um, for people that are actually making decisions on the ground, it's actually very useful to know, for instance, where specific kinds of peat bogs are or heathlands. For instance, in the Netherlands, you have this problem where heathlands are slowly turning into grass or forest. We don't have those maps here. Uh, none of these products do. And um, besides from being limited in usefulness, it's also limited in how innovative they are. Because if you look at some other fields in uh, machine learning, for instance, image recognition, you have data sets and you have machines that can recognize more than a thousand classes. So why are we only limiting, limiting ourselves to like the low hanging fruit, right? Um, besides these things, you make a map and it shows that, you've, that the forest is producing, but you can't really count how much forest is actually gone if you really want to involve money in this, for instance, for carbon credits or whatever. And it's therefore way too risky to base any decisions on. You can use it to inform, but you still have to like send people to the ground and actually measure things. And um, this is complicated by the fact that uh, these maps are free to download, but often the training data and the validation data is not. And um, therefore, it's also hard for people to validate how accurate they really are and also to make better versions or, you know, criticize and pr or just give uh, productive feedback. So to answer these gaps, um, we first have to, have to look at the real culprit here. And the real culprit is that gathering training data for land cover uh, classification is much more expensive than, uh, you know, uh, crawling the internet for uh, cat pictures of cats and hot dogs. Um, and that is further, that, that, that combines with the problem of having more classes in one classification task, lowering the accuracy. A randomly guessing model would also be worse if you have more classes. So any model that uh, tries to, you know, classify more classes will also have a di more difficult task. So if only we had ImageNet for land cover. We don't, unfortunately, but I will get to uh, an attempt at least. ImageNet was released in the year 2006, and it really revolutionized image recognition. It has more than 15 million training images of, well, for instance, cats and hot dogs, and um, thousands, of, like a thousand classes, and also hierarchical legends. So you have, you know, mammals, but also carnivores, and then dogs, and then huskies, for instance, uh, which is a nice way to organize all these classes, of course. And uh, this brings us to what I'm actually working on. Um, I actually realized that what, uh, what we're working on is kind of similar to this because we uh, combined millions and millions of points, not 15 million, but you know, about half, I guess, something like that, uh, from different land cover sources, the Lucas land cover survey and the Korean land cover data. Of course, this is a very coarse map, but it, it was made by humans. And we did some processing there. We threw a bunch of points away that didn't really make sense. And then we you know, were left with like 5 million points from polygons, which also have a hierarchical legend. And at the uh, most complex level, it has 40, 44 classes. We threw away one, oceans, because we don't need to map the oceans. We know where they are. Um, and then we overlaid all those points that we extracted on Landsat data mostly. Also some land surface temperature and some DTM uh, stuff that you can read in the paper if you like. 
Um, basically, these things that you see on the screen right here. I think Leandro already covered this mostly, so I'm just going to gloss over it. Also, because I'm not sure how much time I have left. You also saw this picture already, so um, basically, I have less than two minutes. Thanks. Uh, let's just skip over this then. Machine learning, AI, <laughs> right, Ish? So uh, this is actually something I find interesting because um, it's hard if you have a varying number of classes to really assess how well a model does. And uh, this is something that I'm working on with Carmelo uh, to make legend agnostic performance metrics. Basically, you can see how well a model would have been doing it's doing compared to like a randomly guessing model. And of course, if you have 40 classes, a randomly guessing model will spread the probabilities around, like across all the uh, classes and therefore perform really poorly. And then if you have two, two classes, the probability is like 50-50. And uh, normally, for instance, with the log loss metric, which is used a lot for probabilities, this um, penalizes it heavily and it doesn't really learn to at least do a little bit well. While um, if you make this baseline, where you basically subtract from one the log loss of the model uh, that you're training um, and you divide that by the uh, randomly guessing model, you can actually see uh, it's, it's, it gives a much more fair picture. This is actually inspired by reviewer number two for the first play, uh, uh, paper. Uh, shout out to uh, this anonymous uh, demon from my past. Uh, anyway, results. So the, this is actually where I want to showcase this baseline uh, score because, of course, at the level one, you only have five classes. That's much easier. Uh, you can see that the F1 score is much higher. And at level three, it was only 0.49. Actually, it used to be higher in the first version of the paper. And then they criticized it for being not accurate. And uh, I said, well, it's because we have too many classes. But we're just going to add some more classes just to mess with you. And they really like that. But as you can see from the, uh, the standard deviation of this F1 score, it was very consistent through time and space. And uh, the you know, results look pretty, I think it's a pretty nice uh, GIF. So um, yeah, Leandro showed this picture already. We made maps of every year, 2000 to 2020, uh, with probability layers, uncertainty layers, and also some slopes through time through probability. So you can actually see a gradual increase or decrease, for instance, forests and grasslands which is exactly what's going on in the Netherlands, for instance, with these uh, heathlands that I mentioned. So what I want to work on in the future is I want to further investigate this baseline log loss with its own paper. I want to look more at uh, production, or like uh, prediction uncertainty, so we can actually use this for area estimates. And um, finally, I also really am interested in hierarchical legends and how to leverage them for better performance, and also to make it easy to communicate uh, these things to both humans and also for machines so they can actually understand each other better. That's it. Thank you very much. Awesome very, time. Yeah, on time and Great. also very interesting presentation. Thanks. Thanks. Um, any questions from audience? Yes. Maybe a, a brief question. So uh, what's the key predictors or features that uh, uh, let's uh, help you to achieve better performance. This is question one, and then... You mean in the land cover maps? Yeah. Please? And then uh, can, can we apply this expla uh, explainable uh, AI here? Explainable uh, machine learning, interpretable machine learning uh, type of uh, technique, for example, to explain why such model is working better than other model, for example. Um, okay, so, well, I mean, that's of course uh, two very different questions, but the first one, uh, the variable importance, yeah, NDVI was very important. Also, distance to coasts was very helpful. Uh, I think it's a little bit cheating because, of course, coast is also a land cover, so it's like distance from one specific land cover. But the coast doesn't really change much outside of the Netherlands. Um, and then how can we use interpretable AI? Well. Um, I am looking at something called conformal prediction and I'm trying to implement that in uh, my uh, work and then, well, what is interpretable AI? Is it like, you know, knowing how, like having like a fair estimate of how uncertain the model is? Is it like understanding what kind of, why it makes certain decisions? Like, what do you mean with interpretable AI? Yes, for example, I think this could be a question linked to the first presentation. For example, if you have <coughs> So when you, when you predict the future uh, vegetation distribution, mm -hmm. so, I mean, why? I mean, physically, for example, and uh, what's the key mechanism behind 
Uh, for example, you said the distance to coastal area is one of the key variables, like why, why it is like this. What's the functioning? Basically, I think this is... Postmodal in diagnostics. Yeah. Um, I think if you're projecting into the future, that's much more important, but that's not what I'm doing. Here, we just want to have the highest accuracy possible given the number of classes that we have, I think. I think, um, especially, I think it also, it's made more interpretable by actually having probability layers for every separate class. So even, for instance, like uh, take, a, take an airfield, for instance, like an airport, it has its own class on this map, but it does very poorly. And uh, we were very honest about that in the paper. Um, but, you know what happens? And what, like, if you look at pixels, what does an airfield compose, is, consist of? It consists of roads, grasslands, and buildings. And those were you know, classified very accurately in airports. Like, it's, oh yeah, there's roads here, but it's not road roads, it's airfield roads. And actually, we just wanted to tell it to be the same class. And this is also a problem with uh, you know, the Korean legend that we tried to reproduce not being designed to be optimal for remote sensing. And I think there are bigger gains to be had here than in interpretable AI if you're just trying to recognize things because we're not making any decisions on whether uh, people are committing fraud or uh, have like a big chance of uh, recommitting a crime or something. I think interpretable AI is much more important in these fields. And um, of course, I just talked about carbon credit assessments and stuff for deforestation. And then it's also important not necessarily to know how a model came to a decision because if you use black box models, how informative is it gonna be? Of course, variable importance is a nice way, but also having a statistically sound uncertainty metric is the best way to do it. Because if you can really prove that your model is 99% right about the class, 99% uh, of the time, uh, then you can also see, well, I mean, okay, so we can predict, we, we, we've assessed your deforestation to be within these ranges in your country, for instance. And I think that is the more important part of being interpretable in this context, instead of really seeing why a certain prediction was made. But that's also an opinion, I guess. Okay, uh, this can be discussed with some drinks, actually. So we, there is a lot of work um, ongoing at ITC for explainable AI. So maybe it can be a nice uh, chat topic among, among, um, among you. Definitely. Okay. Thank you very much for this nice uh, pre presentation.